All right, gentlemen, Rick, Jeremy, welcome to Empire. Thank you. Thanks, man. So you've got some excellent reviews. I'd certainly like the movie and recommend it to all our viewers. I and the New York Times, I should say. Does that happen often? I don't think or so. Or the New York Times? That's the exactly why I'm mentioning it. It's kind of scary. Um, it seems like you go on a hunt of sort from, right from the outset, looking for JSOC. What is that? What does it mean exactly? Well, you know, I mean, Rick and I um, had worked together for a long time, and we were talking about doing a project together, and Rick had been spending a lot of time in Afghanistan, embedded, unembedded, um, and I was starting to look at an investigation into special operations forces um, around the world, and we decided to take a preliminary trip to Afghanistan um, together, and we weren't sure exactly what, what it was going to turn into, and we started to investigate this series of night raids, and we, we both had been talking about the idea that there was a war within the war. Um, you know, that you have the conventional forces that you see and journalists are embedded with them. And then you have these elite teams that are really just hunter-killer squads. And so Rick and I started to... Who do they work for, by the way? Well, this is interesting. I mean, you know, the, technically the commander-in-chief, the president, is responsible for all military forces. As in Obama? As in, well, currently the, President Obama, right. So, uh, but the Joint Special Operations Command is, is different than the rest of the military in that it doesn't always operate within the traditional chain of command. It, it really is sort of like the president's private army. It's small, it's elite. Uh, for much of its history, it started in 1980, it has operated in the shadows of, uh, of U.S. policy. Um, involved under the Pentagon? Well, I mean, it's military, so it's under the right. Pentagon, but, but just, just to understand, this is an operation, a, a force that does covert missions, like the CIA does covert missions, that can be denied if they go wrong, or if the U.S. just doesn't want its fingerprints all over So it. completely secretive. Yeah, in fact, the, so the, the very existence of it was, was a secret until just a few years ago. So, the, I mean, the word special, special means secret in this case? Uh, well... Yeah, I mean, this is a force that, uh, that isn't part of the normal sort of NATO chain of command in Afghanistan. So uh, they don't, you know, report to the same kind of structure. They're, they operate globally. Uh, and they were designed to, to be a small unit that went after the most high-level kind of strategic targets. So uh, hostage rescue missions, or like if a nuclear weapon is stolen from Ukraine, these are the guys you send in to sort of lock it down. They were never intended to be uh, fighting a counterinsurgency, like going after mid-level Taliban commanders or, or people who they suspect of being mid-level level Taliban commanders in, in Afghanistan. So when we set out uh, in, um, uh, in Afghanistan, you know, three years ago, we never imagined how far this story would take us. Um, we never realized when we, we started knocking on the doors of compounds in rural Afghanistan, talking to families uh, who were victims of these night raids, that their story would take us to Yemen and Somalia and all of these sort of places off the state of battlefield. So it's where actually not just Afghanistan. This is at a global Look, war. Here's, here, here's how I would put it. This, this force started in 1980 out of the ashes of the failed hostage rescue mission in Iran. And the idea of JSOC was that it was going to be a, an elite secret all-star team taking what at the time was known as SEAL Team 6, Delta Force, the 75th Army Rangers, and then the most elite pilots in the U.S. military called the Night Stalkers. And as Rick says, for much of its history operated in total secrecy. After 9-11, Cheney, Dick Cheney, and Donald Rumsfeld viewed JSOC not just as a tool that could be used to hunt targets around the world, but as the policy itself. The kill capture program became the policy with the emphasis on kill. And so JSOC is put on steroids, this force that had sort of been viewed as kind of the, uh, the unwanted, uh, you know, runt of the, of the pack uh, at, that was only talked about in hushed tones in the Pentagon, all of a sudden becomes the premier counterterrorism force of the United States. And, and for the eight years of the, the Bush administration, it was like Murder, Inc. You know, there's the myth that the surge won the war in Iraq. I mean, first of all, look at Iraq today. How can right. you call anything victory? But these guys killed a tremendous number of people, ran their own interrogation programs, and, and, and then started to operate globally with, so, a, with a mandate to hit anywhere, not just in declared battlefields. And the oversight is for whom? Well, uh, there's very little oversight. I mean, it's, they're, they're covert operations, so they're, they're concealed from the American public. Uh, they run, I mean, they report directly to the executive wing, and they are only briefed to this tiny little uh, gang of, uh, gang of six in the, in the Congress, like the few people, gang of eight in the Congress, who are the few members of the, of the Senate's um, and, and House Intelligence Committees. So there's very little transparency and oversight, and, and those members of the, of the Intelligence Committees are not even allowed to tell the American people what's happening there. But under the Bush administration, they were 
authorized under the Al Qaeda net, uh, network execute order to operate in uh, uh, in 27 countries, in, in you know, in, in a couple dozen countries. Uh, those programs expanded under Obama, so it went up to over 70. And it was leaked a, a, a while ago, a few months ago, that there was a day last year when they were on the ground in 100 countries on the same day. So it's a it's a massive program that was 100 countries in the same day. Yeah. So we're not just talking Somalia and Yemen and so on. Well, look, I mean, many of the countries where they're operating, I mean, they're in Latin America uh, working on targeting drug cartels. Um, they've been throughout uh, South Asia, Southeast Asia. They're, um, they've operated in, uh, in Chechnya uh, in the Republic of Georgia. Uh, they've done covert missions inside of Iran. But m many, of the, many of the places where they're operating, there are small teams of SEALs or Delta Force guys that are embedded with special operations forces of other nations. And technically they're there as trainers or advisors. But often what happens is that they get involved with direct, with what are called kinetic actions. And they're part of JSOC. Yeah, part of JSOC. So, the, so yeah. So, the, so, so the, this is not, it's not just uh, operational. It's also other things. It takes other forms. It mutates to other things like training, like yeah, I mean, it's, it's coordination. A, it's a, I mean, mm -hmm. this is so you know. There's all this focus now on on drone strikes, and I think part, some of it is warranted. I mean, you have this idea that that uh, men are, uh, and, and in some cases, women are sitting in trailers in the southwest of the United States, and they are running bombing campaigns in Pakistan or Yemen or Somalia. <laughs> And then they go home at the end of the day by getting into their SUVs, driving off the base, and there's a sign that says, buckle up, this is the most dangerous part of your day. You know, meaning that you're not going to get killed bombing another country, Which is but you might, you might die in a, tra a traffic accident. Right. Um, so, so, I mean, I understand the sort of spooky aspect of drones and why people focus on it. But the, the most lethal operations, uh, including the ones that have killed the most civilians, were not drone strikes. They're either Tomahawk cruise missile strikes that have been uh, called in by JSOC, or night raids, thousands and thousands of night raids. We don't know who the U.S. is even killing on a daily basis. There are President, certainly no cameras. President to Obama trace them. doesn't know who is being killed in the in the author in the operations that he's authorizing. In many cases, we hear about Bin Laden raid, or we hear about killing you know Anwar al Awlaki, or we hear about killing uh, Baitullah Massoud. But what you don't hear about is when when women and children are killed. When you say you don't hear about, I mean, you guys are both investigative reporters who've covered this stuff. When we look today in Afghanistan and we look at the television screens in America or outside America, what reports are there from Afghanistan outside Kabul? There's very little. There, there's almost none. I mean, first so of all... Is, is it already a forgotten war now? And this JSOC is a... Yeah. It's kind of yeah, I mean, there's, there's some in the look, shadows. Every, everyone in America now knows every single detail about one night raid, the raid that killed Bin Laden. We know how many uh, seals were in the helicopters. We know the make of the helicopters. We know the rifles they carried. We know every every detail. Uh, but we, what the American people don't know is that that same night there were between ten and twenty other night raids in Afghanistan. Thousands of night raids happening every year. Uh, part of it is so we're drowned in details from this one raid, and that raid is supposed to stand in and define what these ten years, this more than a decade of war, meant. Uh, but the whole body of that war, what that war, the real significance of that war for the world and for us as a country is, is completely concealed. So you say that this actually has mutated and, and has become far more global than anyone could have imagined. But we hear President Obama saying, you know, the war needs to end. What you're yeah. saying is, this is exactly the contrary. The war is expanding. Well, you know, when, when President Obama spoke at the National Defense University in May, uh, I almost felt like... Senator Obama was debating President Obama. Uh, you know, it was it was it was he was sort of speaking out of both, both sides of his mouth. Um, you know, on the one hand, he's saying, you know, civilian deaths are going to haunt me to the day I die, and we can't be in a state of perpetual war, and we're going to bring accountability to you know this program. But if you if you strip it down to its to its rawest form, what what did President Obama do in that speech? He asserted. Uh, this radical American exceptionalist agenda: the idea that the United States has a right to bomb any country where it determines its national security interests are, are at play, that it has the right to assassinate people, including its own citizens, who have not been charged with crimes. Um, it, was a, it was a rather bold declaration on Obama's part. And the thing is, President Obama is essentially saying to liberals, but also to the country, trust me. You know, I realize that this could go out of control if it's not checked, but I'm going to check it. What, what does he say then if, you, if, if you, Jeb Bush comes into power? Or God forbid, someone like Sarah Palin, who already is riding around her helicopter shooting animals in the wilderness of you know, Alaska. I mean, the, you think these people are gonna, are gonna roll it back? I mean, he is creating, with his administration, a permanent infrastructure that is intended to legitimize 
and argue that it's legal, this idea that uh, the U.S. can assassinate people around the globe. That, that's going to be one of the enduring legacies of Obama's so-called counterterrorism. This is program. interesting because when we spoke to Oliver Stone earlier, he said something about that instead of repudiating what Bush did, he's actually perpetuating what, uh, what Bush did. But having said that, since we're sitting in a movie theater, I'm reminded by uh, the film A Few Good Men. Uh, at one point, uh, Jack Nicholson, Colonel Jessup says, you rise and you sleep under the blanket with which I provide, and then you question the way I provide it. Yeah. You should either say thank you, or get on your way, carry a gun, and stand on the wall. And I'm paraphrasing. Yeah. What's the alternative? Well, see, this is one of the greatest fallacies of the whole logical construct of the global war on terror. I mean, I'm absolutely convinced from covering this for more than a decade that we're creating more enemies than we're killing in these, uh, in these strikes that are supposedly taking out terrorists. I mean, just look, e even if you don't have a moral problem with the massive civilian casualties that are caused, uh, have been caused in this war, in all these wars that make up the global war, even if you don't have political problems with the lack of transparency, this massive overstep in executive power, uh, strategically, it it's been profoundly counterproductive. On September 11th, Al-Qaeda was a small organization that had no territory, that was on the run. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, after a decade, after hundreds of thousands thousands of civilians dead, thousands of American soldiers, billions of dollars spent. There are tens of thousands of members of Al-Qaeda affiliates. They control pieces, pieces of land in, you know, East Africa and now West Africa, uh, in parts of Yemen. So it's just... So if it's not working, why then is it expanding? Well, why are they getting away with it? Is, is this the dark secret of all secrets? No, look, I, I mean, I actually think that there's, that there's, uh, there's a logic to it, and that's, that's part of what makes it so dangerous. I think that President Obama, let, let, let's look, look at his, his history. This is a guy with no military experience very limited foreign policy experience when he comes into office. He's briefed by Admiral William McRaven, the JSOC commander, General David Petraeus, one of the most powerful people in modern American military history, uh, the heads of the CIA uh, and other intelligence agencies, and they paint a picture for him uh, of a world where there are hundreds of concurrent threats against the United States, attempts to bring down airplanes, to poison the water supplies. What's Obama going to say to them when they say, we need expanded authorities to start striking? We need to preemptively kill the terrorists before they kill us. And if you don't do that, there's going to be an attack on the American homeland. This is how it's presented to him. So you think, so, he, so you think they're wagging him? No, 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 no. So I think they present to Obama that I think there are real threats around the world. And, but what I think happened is that Obama was seduced by this idea that you can preemptively kill the bad guys before they hit you. So, so JSOC became the policy under President Obama. Preventive, and, and he, preemptive. Right, we're engaged in what, what in pre-crime, like the movie Minority Report with Tom Cruise. You know, President Obama expanded these things called signature strikes. The idea that you can target a group of military-aged males whose identities you don't know and against whom you may have no evidence that they're involved with a crime, but you're targeting them on the idea that their pattern of life indicates that they are involved with or may someday be involved with uh, terror plots. So we're engaged in this sort of incredible, grotesque form of pre-crime. When, when the heads of the CIA or JSOC goes and they have their secret briefings with members of the Senate or the House, um, members of Congress say to them, how do we define victory? Who have we killed? Congress is encouraging a war of attrition, <clears throat> this idea that you can kill your way to victory. And I think that that's what we've seen happen from the transition of Bush to Obama. Obama certainly doesn't want to put people in Guantanamo for all sorts of reasons. You know, one of the epic failures of his presidency is the fact that that place remains open. Um, he doesn't really want to give them access to the U.S. court system. So what do you do? Your kill capture program largely becomes a kill program. So, so what you're saying is that the clean war is actually the dirty war. Exactly. What was attempted to be clean is, and sterile yeah. is, is descending into a dirty war. I mean, and I think people realize this. There are, um, you know, people who come forward to, to speak on camera in the film and, and say, people who are inside the intelligence and security community in the in defense community in the U.S., who see that, um, that you know, this, the fallacy that this whole thing is built on is that there's a finite number of enemies and once you kill them, you have no more enemies. Not that, you know, but there's an army ranger in the film, Andrew Exum, who says, you know, in Iraq, you have a deck of cards, 55 names. Uh, but you can work your way through those 55 names, then you get a list of 300 names. Right. You work your way through the 300, you get 3,000. Um, some of these guys talk about this, they, they say it's like mowing the lawn. You know, when, uh, when insurgency or jihadism rise above a certain level, you kill off the leadership. 
and the grass grows back. So it's, so it's perpetual. It's managing a perpetual state uh, situation of, of manageable violence, trying to just deny, knowing that they're going to grow and become stronger on the ground in places like Yemen and Somalia, but preventing them from gaining the logistical sophistication necessary to get on a plane and come to the U.S. You know, one of the things we, you know, we tried to do in the film is to show, I, I, I detest the term collateral damage. You know, I don't think any American would uh, allow their loved ones to be called collateral damage uh, if they were killed in the pursuit of a bad guy somewhere in a robbery or something else, oh, they were just collateral damage. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a despicable term. But what we tried to do in the film was to show the human face of who lives in these countries. Right. You know, I remember when the Boston Marathon bombing happened, we knew every detail about the victims. Uh, and it's because journalists did their job. We empathize with them because we see them as our own. It could have been, our, you know, the eight-year-old boy could have been our son. You know, the graduate students could have been our sisters. Um, and, 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 and the reason that it hit us so hard is that we see ourselves in them or we see some part of our experience. What we tried to do in the film is to say, the little girl in Yemen that you see, whose family was wiped out, uh, has dreams too. She's a real person. Uh, her family is not collateral damage. Those were real people that were killed. Uh, it, unless we back away from this uh, radical American exceptionalist view of the world and the idea that American lives are worth more than other people's lives and that they're not worthy of our empathy, nothing is fundamentally going to change in our society. So that, that's part of what we tried to do in the film. This is amazing. So I think this is, uh, this is the part where when you conduct anything in secret, you're basically dehumanizing every possible victim in whatever that war We're programmed. you're waging. We're programmed to dehumanize the rest of the world. The world is divided between the noble knights from the United States trying to save the day for peace, freedom, and democracy, and the terrorists that are plotting against freedom. And, and everything and, in between and is everything the in, there, There's damage. no gray in between. Yeah. And, and, and that's, that, that's, that's a radical ideology if you think about it. Yeah. I mean, and so parts of this war are hidden completely, are never reported, and the parts that are in the U.S. too often, you know, we see this war filmed from the noses of bombs or from, you know, helicopter drone footage, and we hear it narrated to us by former generals on cable news. I mean, we never get to have the camera on the other side of that whole military media apparatus. So, yeah, I mean, a huge... And one of the things that film does, I think, better than any other medium, is create the possibility for human identification with people who you're separated from by this massive cultural and geographic distance. We're all for human identifications. Yeah. Gentlemen, Rick, Jeremy, thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thanks.